Welcome to episode 38 of Talking Prisoner. Another massive guest with us today. This guest appeared in 32 episodes in the final year of Prisoner in 1986. She was brought in as a replacement in, as the original actress who was struck down with glandular fever at the time. Our guest has also appeared in Neighbours, A Country Practice, A Cry in the Dark, Golden Braid, Wedlocked, The Dame Was Loaded, and State Coroner. She was also a unit manager on Golden Braid and a production assistant on Ireland. She subsequently left acting and became a university lecturer. We're, of course, talking about Terry Waddell, who played the second incarnation of Lisa Mullins. <laughs> Welcome to Talking Prisoner. Good morning, Ken, and thank you for coming Hi. on. Hello, Matt. Hello, Ken. Hi, Lisa. <laughs> Absolutely <laughs> honoured to have you on with us this morning. Nice to be here. Yeah. On this hot morning. Hot morning um, is in Melbourne. Definitely. Yeah. Now, um, before we get into prison, which the fans will be dying for us to, can we learn a little about your life growing up as a child? Uh, uh, well, uh, yes. I, I uh, was brought up in Melbourne when I was little, and then our family moved to the coast. So, and I had a number of cousins who lived down the coast, and they all looked like fire of force majors, and I didn't, and they all went down... <laughs> Uh, watching their boyfriends surf and I couldn't stand all that stuff so I spent a lot of my time reading books and doing things and um, making stuff and yeah but I did love the beach it was beautiful if not a bit isolated in the 70s down there um, when I was little I think I think one of the questions you asked me was about did I like to do performing is that I thought about I, what I used to do was I used to stand on the dining room table and oh. it, it, even thinking about my childhood, I don't talk to this with many people, of course, I, I stood on the table and we had two little lights. This was in the 60s. We had two little lights that came down from the wall. You can imagine those 60s. They're very cool yeah. now. Yeah. But I used to put them on myself so they looked like spotlights and I would dance on the, <laughs> the dining room table with about five or six when I did that. So I enjoyed doing that. Wow. Um, well, I guess it was kind of an average childhood and adolescence. Because we, I lived on the coast, we had to bus our way into secondary school, ah. um, which was a long, long journey. So they were always long days. <clears throat> yeah. Wow. Can you tell us what uh, about school? And, and did you have a favourite subject or, or an unfavourite subject? <laughs> Uh, sport was probably my unfavourite subject. <laughs> the, the only thing I liked about sport was, was running. I did enjoy that. But the rest of it, gymnastics, was terrified me. Um, but I loved drama and English. And in secondary school, I really liked history. I guess they, they, and I did speech. I was dragged to speech classes from the time I was six. So I did those. I, I didn't like them all that much. Um, but yeah, I guess I really enjoyed English and I really enjoyed drama. And they were the things I went on to major in at university. So it was a constant from primary school right through to secondary. And I was really lucky at the sort of primary school I went to, which was actually just around the corner from the school that Carly Valley went to. I found out. Oh, really? Um, we, we studied together at VCA. I, I remember her saying that. Um, they had a really good drama. Um, department there and a good music department and a good choral singing um, scene so I really enjoyed that and then when I moved to the coast they didn't have all that at my school and I really really missed that but they had wonderful uh, English um, teachers so yeah amazing when did you know you you wanted to be an actress and and what did your parents think I didn't seriously think about, I mean, I enjoyed amateur theatre. I did that. Um, I did drama at school and I really enjoyed it. And then I went to university and I majored in drama and English and I enjoyed it then. But the thought of actually being an actor seriously wasn't, I was going to be a teacher. That was what I was thinking of oh, doing. Okay. Yeah, but then I finished my BA and really wanted to 
to act. And it was, you know, it's a scary thing when you think, oh, should I do this? Should I, could I ever do this? You know, is it really possible to do this? And you go, oh, I'll take the plunge and I'll audition for it. So, yeah, I auditioned for NIDA and I got into the state finals of that, which unfortunately I didn't, didn't get through that. Um, but VCA at the same time, uh, that was Victorian College of the Arts and I auditioned for that. And that's where I spent the next three years. Wow. And that after that is when I came, when I actually acted for a profession. Just on, um, just on NIDA, I mean, that is such a hard place to get into. I mean, <laughs> speak to so many people that said they wanted to get into NIDA and it was just so intensive to try and get in there. And Oh, it is. It, but it's the, it, it, at, at, at that period in the 80s, I mean, there are a lot more drama schools now and some amazing people have come out of Perth, you know, South Australia, Queensland. Then it was a bit more isolated. So it was really just VCA and um, NIDA for professional acting. And VCA sort of more had a reputation of being about theatre and generating your own work, whereas NIDA was all very, it seemed to us, very film and television centric. That's, it was very, a theatre, of course, but um, much more than the kind of, kind of grassroots community theatre, making your own theatre that, that VCA more or less had a reputation for. Yeah. But they were both professional acting training institutes. Yeah. Do you think it's still as hard as it was back then now at NIDA to get into? I'm sure it is. Yeah. I'm sure it is. I don't really know. It was really nerve-wracking and there were rounds and rounds you had to go through. Yeah. And going through both of those places at the same time, um, very interesting the differences in the, the staff and the way you were sort of treated and at, at those auditions and how terrifying it was. Yeah. I guess, you know... Uh, People think actors are a bit fearless and people who like performing, but it is it is terrifying. And particularly when you're young and you're auditioning in front of professionals and people you really have admired, people you knew, you read about, um, it is scary. Yeah, I don't it's know how they do it. Taking a plunge. <laughs> I remember doing a school play when I was in grade six and I, and I, it was Annie and I was Mr. Warbucks and I froze. I mean, oh, really? <laughs> I, I just, I, yeah, I couldn't do it. <laughs> so I don't know how, yeah, I, I take my hat off to everyone that does perform. It's amazing. It's a um, funny kind of thing because when you actually get on stage, well, the first thing I did when I came out of VCA was I did a play called Antigone. That was the first thing. And then I did Prisoners straight after that. So it was very raw. And, um, but the nerves that happened, particularly in theatre, were um, all before that. And once you hit the stage, oh. something takes over you and it's entirely different. Yeah. And it's when I first started lecturing too, you, you can get a bit, in the end, you know, after about a year, <laughs> you've done it so much, you get used to it. But you get a little nervous about doing it. Once you start, you know, you know the stuff. You just... Yeah, comes naturally. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. Now, um, in your spare time, I'm not sure how much you have of spare time, but do you have any hobbies that you like to do? Uh, yeah, I like to, I like to run. That's what I do in my spare time. Um, uh, I like to build things. I built built the balustrade for my staircase, and you know, oh, out of wow. yeah, out of iron piping. I loved it, and all that kind of stuff. I love reading, and I love cinema. And I've been going to a few films at the French Film Festival. Oh wow! Now, yeah, yeah there's a wonderful film called Comp Compromat on, which is just terrific, and another one called Young Lovers that I I loved. Amazing. Yeah. Do you want? Do you have? A favourite food, and and do you like to cook? I do like to cook. I'm getting better at it because now I'm retired. I retired in 2020, right at the end of that that year, which was you know pretty shocking, horrific, you know, wasn't it? Um, and I had actually time to cook. Before that, I had no time to do anything. <laughs> you'd come home and you'd. Sort of prepare stuff on the weekend that you could 
have during the week or you get takeout stuff or it would be food that was just easy to put together and now there's time to sort of mm, enjoy things and enjoy actually experimenting with stuff and following a recipe was something I never did but anyway I can make I like I can make and I like orange poppy seed cake oh yum yes where you put the whole oranges in the saucepan wow it's fantastic um I like omelettes that sounds boring but I really do like omelettes Omelette. and I love anything from the sea yeah and I like champagne <laughs> and prosecco <laughs> We're coming to your place for breakfast, omelettes. And- <laughs> we'll have champagne with omelettes, will we? <laughs> I think they said during the pandemic, the amount of bread and cakes that were made was just gone through the, you know, everyone was baking bread and cakes. <laughs> the sourdough thing was a thing, yeah. wasn't it? I never, yeah. never got into that. No. <laughs> what was it like when, it, when the pandemic hit for you? Like when it all started, you were still at the uni? Oh. Um, yeah, well, uh, La Trobe University is where I worked for the last 23 years. And I had just finished a, you sort of go through, when I started in 1998, I started off as an associate lecturer, um, a kind of position that they really um, no longer have anymore. You go straight usually to lecturer. You know, and then it goes lecturer, senior lecturer, associate professor, professor, and then usually retire. <laughs> so um, I was an associate professor at the end and, and you start off doing, um, you teach obviously students and research, which for us in humanities and screen studies and media um, is, I did a lot of um, book writing, book editing, article writing, chapter writing, um, a few research projects, you know, but you you also do more administrative work at that level. So I was head of department for the last three years, which is very very difficult. <laughs> it's a, you know a managerial position, so it's tough. So I, I kind of had a reward. I think I applied for research leave and was able to get back in the first six months of that pandemic, and and I wrote. I think four articles during that time, which I really, really enjoyed. Yeah. And then for the next six months, when I came back in July to the end of the year, I had online teaching because we were all online yeah. at that stage and had to learn it very quickly. And I had the most beautiful classes of students. They were just gorgeous. And, and there was a real intimacy that I didn't expect. I thought it would be so hard to teach online. Yeah. But, but I, really, I really enjoyed doing it. Uh, and then, um, you know, of course, there were cuts and it was very difficult and uh, we were offered options of whether we wanted to retire and, and so many of us and my colleagues that were around uh, my era decided to do that. Wow. And haven't looked back. But I had, I was going to go to a conference for part of this research at the beginning of the year. I was going to go to a conference in Philadelphia and then I was going to do some research in England and I had for a month and I had booked everything. <laughs> and I had uh, and I had a PhD student in the Philippines that I was also going over to see. Oh wow. And all of that had to be cancelled. I'm still traumatized. I, I might travel because I haven't got over yeah. having to cancel all of those bookings and you know, it takes six months to to put all that together and to make all the connections. Yeah. that you need to make to do it and it was but then you put your disappointment in that huge basket of what other people have gone through and it just seems like nothing you know will you still go though like you can still go in the future or um I, not to conferences not now that i've um i've left the university um i'd love to go overseas when i can but i want to to go when it was safe to go yeah yeah definitely um, now, you spoke about movies that you're watching before in the cinema. Do you have a favourite TV show that you like? And everyone was binge watching something during the pandemic. So. Oh, yes. Well, I've written a lot and loved Twin Peaks and Peaks, The yeah. X-Files in the 90s. They were my favourite shows. And yeah. I did I kind of, you know, wrote a lot about them. But um, I loved 
mayor of East Town. Mary oh, Kate Winslet. Heard about that? Yeah. Absolutely loved it. I loved. I love the Scandinavian thrillers. You know, in the early ones, The Bridge, um, and then there's so many that I can't sort of. Um, I can't list them. I love Succession. I got into Succession. Oh, how good is that? Brian you know, a friend Fox. of mine who's actually on Neighbours, he got me into it. Yeah. Um, yeah. That, I love that show. That's, that's great. And it's so much like King Lear. It's brilliant. Um, and now there's a great comedy I recommend to people called This Way Up, an Irish comedy with um, Ashlyn B. She's a British comedian, Irish comedian. Okay. And it, it's be it's absolutely beautiful. I loved about really about two sisters and their relationship. Um, so I watched that with my sister. It was just wonderful. And I also absolutely loved the newsreader, you know, the Australian drama. Oh, I've heard, yeah, I haven't seen that yet. A lot of good things yeah. about it. Yeah. Oh, it's you know with Anna Tor. I, I was love, and I loved Mind Hunter that she was into and Secret City. I can't name everything else. I've just thought of a few that I really liked, but um, yeah, like so much. Yeah, there's so much good stuff out there, isn't there? Oh, there is. There is. Um, Actually, we had Mel Walden on not long back, and he uh, he said the newsreader was great too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> good endorsement from Mel. <laughs> oh, it really reminded me of that period and mm, the clothes and those big clothes, you know, with the big shoulders that were very. Yeah. Mm. Now you played Meredith Lord in Neighbours in 1987. Can you tell us about that and what it was like going back to Nunna Wadding so soon after Prisoner ended? And can you also give us your thoughts on the recent axing of Neighbours? Yeah, I mean, it's sad that it's axed. I think it's sad for the actors, but um, it's been going an awful long time. I mean, exceptionally. I don't imagine they ever thought it would have gone so long when it started. So I just think congratulations on it having such a long run and being successful for such a long time. Uh, and it'd be lovely if Carly Minogue came back and <laughs> yes, <laughs> if they filmed another episode, I don't know. But I used to see her walking down the corridor um, at Channel 10. Ah. Uh -huh. And when we were filming yeah. down there. Wow. Um, and Neighbours, look, I, I actually, it was only a very short thing I did. I was in and out. I think it was only two days or something like that. So I don't remember a great deal about yeah. it. Um, I don't think there was anything exceptional on it that I did or remember. I'm afraid I can't <clears throat> give you any juicy tidbits. Uh, that's okay. <laughs> Just mentioning Kylie was enough. Um, They've brought Harold back too. Harold's coming back, so that's a, that's a good thing. All right, okay. <laughs> um, now you've also worked behind the scenes as well on, on on productions. What what's it like behind the camera than being in front of it? Oh, good, good. I mean, it, I know that um, I think on the movie internet database, and I haven't looked at the credits for those two Paul Cox films that I did some work on, Island and The Golden Braid. Yeah. They're very highfalutin titles, what I actually did, which was really dog's body work, just doing, you know, running work and things like that. But I decided that I would leave acting when I was about 29 and I thought I'd go back to university and do a dip head. And I'd also booked an overseas trip for four months and it was the first time I'd gone to Europe and I backpacked around Europe by myself. Wow. But I had connections in each country. And <clears throat> Paul Cox was making a film island in Greece in a little island called Astapalia. And the, one of the guys that was the, um, I think, the director of photography on that, I had worked with him on a student film and they'd mentioned that they were going to Greece. And I said, oh, I'd love to come, I'd love to do anything. I'd just love to watch, you know, I just, you know, I would really be really interested. So they said it. Uh, so I rang, I, I rang uh, his company up and they said, well, let us know when you're in Athens. And it was all very kind of, mm. and so when I was at Athens, I rang them up again. They said, yeah, come over. <laughs> and it was amazing. And I got a little place to stay and I, I knew 10 Greek words. So I was able, to, I, 
worked with the local people in the restaurant there and helped um, helped out there and did uh, running back to Athens to get props and came back and yeah it was just doing little odd jobs around that shoot and it was really incredible and after that I just that's how I got involved with his next film which was a similar just a little yeah. little things on that um, and I went continued my trip around Europe and ended up in England and then went home and started to do a diploma in education I still thought I was going to do acting then but I wasn't sure how seriously and teaching was just another way to to sort of earn money when it, and that that spilled into an academic career and I left just just going back to Greece just for a minute I, I love Greek food what was the food like do you remember yeah I loved it I loved it it was it was just because seafood you know I love seafood it was terrific wow. and oh yeah Uzo was great um no, yeah, everything about the food was fantastic. Yeah. And it's one place I would love to go back to at some stage. I really, really enjoyed it. And then, and French food was amazing. Mm. I ate so much brie and bread. <laughs> <laughs> the best. If you, were, um, if you were asked, would you ever go back to acting? No. I, I said that unequivocally. <laughs> No, I wouldn't. I, th I think acting takes, um, it takes training. It takes a lot of time. And uh, no, I've been out of it for so long that I don't have those skills anymore. And I think people that go into it are highly skilled and you need to keep that up. And I've been on a totally different career path for the last 20, uh, longer I think 25 years or something 26 years 27 years <laughs> it's hard to to think back that it, it, it wouldn't be and, and it's I left it because I wasn't passionate about it anymore you know I, I thought about it it's interesting because I trained in it for so long um, and it was kind of like I've never been married but I imagine it was kind of like getting a, a divorce or breaking up it was really hard to say goodbye but once the passion's gone, it's kind of gone. Yeah. And I think the people that stay in it still have that passion, and I think that's fantastic. Yeah, for sure. Um, now, yeah, you moved away from acting to become a lecturer in media studies. What made you go down that path? I, I, I didn't plan it. I just enjoyed it. And so I did this. I did a diploma to train as a secondary teacher. Um. And then I didn't enjoy that so much. And I became more involved in the university culture as a mature age student and decided I'd do my master's. And so I got a scholarship to do that. And then there was the option to go on and do a PhD. See, now most students will just do an honours year or an equivalent oh, okay. and go straight into a PhD. But when I did it in the 90s, you had to do a master's before you did a PhD. And then I did, I enjoyed that so much. And so then I did a PhD, which was much, much harder than I had imagined. Um, but uh, yes, completed that and then went into. So, so it all kind of tumbled into just leading you in a, and going with your gut about yeah. what gives you pleasure and enjoyment. And I really did like writing. And yep. I did like teaching. I've been doing a lot of tutoring work as well. Ah, okay. Wow. Yeah. Amazing. Now, we've covered your question, Ken. Um, now, you're also the author of a book called The Lost Child Complex in Australian Film. How did yeah. that come about? Uh, well, you know, I'd done a couple of books before that. And I, I look at analytical psychology or Jung music contemporary of Freud's was actually a student of Freud's and I was very interested in his work and so my books have been based around using uh -huh. his theory and applying it to film and television oddly enough you actually didn't like a lot of <laughs> film oh, really? um, he died I think in 1961 a year I was born wow. um, 
yeah, and so I was interested in, in doing a book about looking at this idea of the lost child in Australian film. And, and I thought, this is such a cliche, maybe I shouldn't do it, you know, when I was planning to do it. And then I thought, no, maybe we're over this. And so as I was writing the outline to put to Routledge, um, that was the publisher of the book. All these films just kept coming up, like Predestination, and that were all about the lost child. It would continue and continue and continue. I mean, even the newsreader, in some ways, is about the lost child. Um, so that there's, it's really interesting to write about this in a different way. And I don't, didn't see it as, as something that was negative I wanted to talk about it as something that was quite positive and quite humbling about our culture that we go back to this idea of the child to really learn more about ourselves and then of course I talked about um, the more negative side of it when we actually displace children and make them lost yeah. so, um, with Indigenous kids and so that was something I also touched on because I don't think it was something you could not you know, not talk about. Um, but because Indigenous studies is really not my area, I focused much more on other aspects of the lost child. Wow. Amazing. Yeah, I enjoyed writing it. I think it's the most pleasant writing experience. I had all, all writing books is hard, but, yeah, I found that really interesting. Amazing. Ken writes a lot as well. <laughs> Yes. I do. Yes, I do. Um, but just apart from me, <laughs> apart from going back to Greece, do you have any future uh, ambitions that you want to fulfil? I would like, I'd like to write more. I mean, at, at the moment, I'm just enjoying having a holiday, although last year I did have a lot of writing projects that I had to finish because um, they were hanging over from the year before. And, yeah. you know, I'd like to try and write non-fiction. I think just for myself. And if it gets published, that's a real bonus. And if people like it, that's a real, real bonus. <laughs> but uh, I, I think just for, to see if you can do it, you know, to explore that in some way. That's, uh, yeah, that's something I'd like to, to do. Look forward to that. <laughs> Definitely. Um, um, now, let's get to one of the greatest Australian TV shows of all time, Prisoner. You appeared mm. in 32 episodes of Series 8 in its final year, 1986, between episode 657 and the very iconic last episode, 692. Now, we all know that you replaced uh, Nikki Paul as Lisa Mullins due to her illness. So how, how did that all come about? How did the... Did you have to audition for the part or they knew that you were perfect for it no I didn't audition for it um not that I can remember it was very very quick uh, we had the same acting agent basically oh, and so I think it was serendipity we we don't look alike or we didn't look alike then and um but I guess you can make people with hair you know <laughs> cut my hair uh, so yeah I, it was very quick I think it was a matter of a day or two even Wow. that I was contacted and was in there, you know, getting my hair cut and speaking to Nikki and trying on her wardrobe. You know, it was really, really quick and shocking. And uh, there were, I remember there was an article they did in TV Week called Terrified <laughs> <laughs> about, about that change. And I, I, I wasn't terrified, but it was certainly um, like a whirlwind going on around you. And I'd never done television before then. I was so young. I was about 24 or something, 25. So, wow. yeah, it was exciting and very quick and yeah. unexpected. <laughs> Had you actually met Nikki before that? I knew Nick, Nikki went to Victorian College of the Arts. And so I knew of her. I didn't know her uh, well then. It's really funny thing at that acting school. Um, it, it's in Melbourne and it has, I think, five different schools. So oh, dance, wow. music. A and when I first went there, I thought, oh, wouldn't this be great? You can, it'd be like fame. You can go and 
play mu music and dance, and, but the curriculum is so tight and it's so heavy that you barely get time to know the people in the year above you or the year below you in the acting school, let alone get to mix with everybody else um, in the other schools. So that's what it was like. You really knew the people in your year. Yeah. And you didn't know the people in the above or the below you very well, but you went to their plays and you saw them perform and you kind of looked up to them. And so, yes, yeah, so I didn't, I knew who she was, but I didn't know her well. And yep. then when I got in there, um, she was very good at a handover. We talked about the character and we talked about how she'd, um, what she, she, she thought her trajectory was. And so that was all very, yeah. Was that a bit daunting? Fun. Was that a bit daunting though? I mean, you know, normally when you get a part on a TV show, you just sort of put your own sort of spin on it. Whereas yeah. you're taking over a, a character you know was, did you feel a bit sort of nervous at the time or oh yeah 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 very nervous because unlike doing a play where you've got it's in stages you've got audition rehearsal um performance this is just bang and go in and do it yeah it's so quick and the experience of thinking that so many people would watch it, uh, that, that kind of didn't occur to me. I was just getting my head around getting the clothes, uh, <laughs> right? <laughs> getting um, my hair cut, learning the lines and getting, having that. I mean, when I was a student at VCA, I sometimes used to like to tell a little bit my students that if you think this is hard, that was really hard. It was extraordinarily hard three years at that college to go through. It was tough. But being in prisoner was tougher. Like I was exhausted most of the time. You'd get picked up at 5.30 in the morning. Wow. And I lived in the sort of inner city then and you get driven out to Mount Wooding um, in makeup because I was in remand at that period. I had to full makeup. That was the nice, nice thing about it. And then you might have a scene in the morning, you might have a scene in the afternoon, you might have a scene just before close, which was around 7, and 7.30. And then you'd get changed, get cleaned up and go home. And it would be like a 5 to 8.30 day when your storyline was um, act very active, which yeah. I can think was an active storyline. So it, it was daunting in just, uh, I think, coping with everything, um, managing everything. And there wasn't a... Um, luxury to be indulgent about it. You just had to sort of get through it. And you're talking about makeup before. I mean, there wasn't a lot of makeup on uh, Prisoner, was it? No, but I had makeup. I had a lot of really... Probably you needed it. it. But... That is such a lovely thing to get made up, um, to just sit in this chair and have these really sweet, they were really nice people um, to do your face and do your hair and and it was so relaxing. It was, <laughs> I remember working on The Dame is Loaded and we had the most beautiful uh, woman who did the makeup and and hair and she would put cucumbers on your eyes and then <laughs> she was so lovely. And yeah, a few people would get to experience that. And so I was very lucky to- Sounds relaxing. To be able to, to have that makeup experience on Prisoner, yeah. Yeah. Um, now the question I was gonna ask was about a character breakdown of Lisa, which you would have had because she was already on the show as an, mm. another actress, but did you know it was gonna be for the 32 episodes that you're on there or was it a shorter? No. Okay. No, I was really not sure. Again, I can't remember my contract. I can't remember what I signed on to. But I was, I, I know I was interested in moving on and doing other things. So I didn't know it would be so long and I didn't envisage it as being, you know, a year after year, as a lot of actors on soap operas go through. I That wasn't in my head yeah. at all. Um, yeah. Had you actually seen the show prior to getting the role? Yeah, yeah. I know my, my sister loved the character of Lizzie 
Lizzie, yeah. Killer Florence, and she used to write to her. So oh. we would watch it. <laughs> wow. Yes, and she was very little at the time. So I don't know if this grandmothery kind of relationship she had to that character, but she just loved it. She just loved it. Um, yeah, and I'd seen it. We'd all, we'd all seen it. It was the thing to watch then. And every actress at the time had been on it, you know, yeah. to a bigger or a lesser degree. It was sort of like a rite of passage to do that show. Yeah. Actually, that's been one of the joys of doing this podcast is hearing all the stories about Sheila Florence and most of the oh, yeah. and crew and even Ken have got some, yeah, fantastic stories about her. It's been great. Yeah. I never met her. It was long before yeah. I came on board. But, mm. Yeah. Now, we first see you as Lisa when the character is changing her hair from blonde to dark brown and your head pops up from the sink cell. Was that strange for you as it was for the viewers? I think probably would have been stranger for the viewers to look at that. I, I did <laughs> wonder how people would cope with it. Um, I mean, back at that time, there was no social media or anything, you know, that, that, that people could comment on things. And <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Um, I know it's always tricky when a, a new person takes over a character on a long-running show. Yeah. No, it, I, I've, I just hoped it would fly, I guess. And I had to get my hair. They didn't ask me, not that, I'm sorry, not that I can remember. They didn't ask me uh, to dye my hair blonde. And I think that because I think I probably would have done it. I would have done anything, you know, probably would say, sure. That's <laughs> <laughs> not a kid. Um, <laughs> But they did insist that it be cut short. And I remember that was something that they asked me specifically if that was all right. And they said really short. So, yeah, and I liked it. I mean, that that haircut was very in the 80s, so. Yeah, it was. Yeah, very yeah. 80s. Yeah. Yeah. That and um, those kind of curls. What were they called? Um, like spring curls. That was oh, the perm. perms. Perms, yeah. Spiral perm. That was very... <laughs> <laughs> well, the mullet's made a comeback, so maybe the perm will uh, come back as well. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> um, we covered uh, your question, Ken, haven't we? Yep. Now, you worked with a lot of people on the show, a lot of different cast members. Did you have... Now, I know it's probably hard to say, but did you have a favourite that you enjoyed working with, someone that you really bonded with? on the show? Well, I think I remember working most with Paula Duncan. Yep. Who played a character called Lorelei and Roseanne. Uh, we had a lot of scenes together. I remember there was one scene where she had to lift me or I had to lift her and drag her somewhere. <laughs> I just remember that was so funny. Um, but most of them were with, yeah, I think with Paula. She she was my best friend, I think, at some stage. Yeah. yeah. And I like doing scenes with um, Philip Hyde, who I was at BCA with. Uh, he oh, was okay. Friend. Rodney Adams. Rodney Adams. <laughs> yes, screw. Yeah, yeah. Um, I remember when I came in and they did a show reel when we when the show closed, and there was a big party, and they did a show reel of bloopers at the end of it. And there was one scene they had me, because they kept making me change my voice and making me talk like that a lot, you know, <laughs> really broad, which I wasn't used to. And there was a scene I was doing with Phil and um, I was talking like that and saying something, defending myself over something or other. And, uh, and I, I messed up my line. And so I was talking with that and I, oh, Philip, I said, I'm really sorry, I've forgotten that. <laughs> <laughs> and it was in context, it was hilarious because it just totally fell out of character. But, yeah, there were a number of us from the same year at college who got on to prisoner at the same time. And yeah. Philip was one of them. And there was Kylie Belling, uh, Victoria Rowland, and uh, Taya Stratton. I think that's all. But it was sort of surprising, yeah. Yeah. We were called Company 85 because you were oh, called company the company of the year that you graduated. Okay. Wow. 
There's actually a fan question coming up about Philip and uh, yeah, what it was like to work with him and. Oh uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> do you want? Do you have a favourite storyline or episode or scene that you did, or what are your standout memories of the show? Um, I remember the doors wobbling, the prison cells <laughs> wobbling. I think everyone has prob probably says that too. Wasn't a real prison? <laughs> No, oh my God. and then they would shut the door. <laughs> like you had a scene and you were in a temper or something and I slammed the door, it would just bang open again <laughs> or it would just wobble. <laughs> <laughs> um, I remember that. Um, yeah, I remember a, a storyline where uh, there were mice involved. And, uh, oh, that's right. <laughs> terrifying and, and and tay's character i think spider was putting mice into somebody's cell or something and then kendall one of the directors would try and i remember he tried to scare me with his mouth i remember that um i remember this when i was thinking about um you know our date to do this uh, i just remember the time that lisa mullins lost her voice she was was uh, yeah she couldn't speak and she, and suddenly she knew how to do sign language do you remember that oh. and i was lying in a hospital bed for a couple of days that was a bit of a luxury but this, this <laughs> automatic i knew how to do sign language and i was like making it up as i was doing it which was i'm sure very disrespectful um that's what i remember uh, I remember the time the guys came into the prison and suddenly there were male actors in this yep. female enclave that, that we had out there at the studio. Um, and, of course, I remember it, it coming to an end and the decisions around that. Yeah. It's funny you just talked about the, the wobbly walls and everything. We... Um... Coral Druin's interview just went up the other day and she's talking about how the, the cell bars were broomsticks painted. Oh, <laughs> were they? Everyone's making comments on that. Oh, my God, I thought they were real bars. Now, now the <laughs> broomsticks have shattered my dress. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Kevin would know all about the, uh, the, the, the sets. <laughs> oh, yes. and the laundry scene, the laundry set. Yes. A lot of um, fond memories of those wooden bars and uh, <laughs> the steam coming out of the um, laundry press, etc. That's right. Yeah, dry ice. Yeah. <laughs> Which used a, a great deal then. Yeah, they yeah. were they were fun times. But with the wobbly walls, of course, there'd be extra sandbags thrown onto the um, braces or else um, we'd call in some more stage hands to get behind the walls and hold them so they wouldn't. Oh, <laughs> really? Uh, used to happen. Maybe they'd sturdied them up a bit by the end of the show. Uh, so I... No, I don't think so. No, they didn't. <laughs> I think it was call in another team of stage hands. <laughs> get them to brace them. <laughs> Now you um you had a lot of scenes with the character Merle, who's a real big fan favorite, Roseanne Hull Brown. What was it like yeah. working with Roseanne? Any memories? Oh, great, yeah, great. She was she was lovely. But everybody was so it was really you know a nice environment to work in. Yeah, it was um, very friendly, um, very giving. Everyone understood, but very demanding, and people were great at understanding that um yeah yeah it was a sort of ensemble and it was good working with people who had roles as extras too yeah. they were great everyone just kind of mixed together um so and some of the the cast i think were originally extras in it and came from that history and they would sit and talk about you know the whole um beginning of of prisoner and how it had changed and so it was it was fascinating well i think that one extra you're talking about lois colander who was uh, yeah i worked a bit with lois she yeah, was lovely she's amazing yeah yeah, yeah um, 
now we get to a, a, a bit of a difficult question or a bit of a hard scene to shoot. Um, that was the filming with Peter Lindsay when Stud attempted to rape Lisa. How did you cope with that? It was, it was actually, I did speak about this. I did, um, I don't speak about being on prisoner really at all, but there was a conference at a university in Melbourne and there was a forum there. And um, I did mention it there, but because it is, it was one of those things that kind of surprises you. You, you do something that's all very ordinary and very safe and everyone's around you. And there was this scene where this male prisoner had to attempt to attack Lisa and it was all very choreographed, you know, you move here, he will grab, hold you here, you'll move here and then you'll go to, I think it was on, on the, the, the small narrow prison bed and he will hold you down and then, and then you walk through that, you just walk through it and it's done. Uh, and then you get a stunt coordinator that comes in and tells you how to fall properly, how to look like you're resisting when no one's putting any pressure on you. Yep. All that stuff. So, you know, it looks more brutal than it is. Uh, but I remember this one part of it and the actor, Peter, yeah, he was holding my wrists down and he said to me, look, before they shot, he said, look, I'm not putting any pressure on you. Do you want me to just put a bit more pressure on your wrists? And he wasn't putting any pressure on me and I could not move. And that actually really sort of shook me a bit, yeah. which was these unexpected things happen. Yeah. Um, so then he was so nice about it. And all of the, the men that did come on, there was another guy in another scene where I was in an apartment. He had to come and pretend to rough me up all three times. Oh, yes. Yeah, that's right. And all these guys were so nice. And they said, look, we really don't like, you know, it was just so sweet and they didn't like doing it. And, um, well, I mean, they, it was an acting role, but you know what I mean. They were, um, yeah, it was all very kind and very gentle. And and, it, and it's not supposed to appear that in the finished yeah. product. Yeah. But, yeah, so it was just that one little thing. And I thought, oh, this is really a bit scary. Wow. I, I do have to say, out of the entire run of Prisoner, that whole Blackmore period was a, was a very dark period of prisoner you know the it was a the, bit. the bashings and the the riot and yeah it was very not prisoner yeah. it'd be interesting to know why that decision was made beyond the obvious to sort of shake it up and give it a new yeah. energy um uh, yeah definitely now also you had some amazing scenes with glenda lynn scott who played reader the beater the top dog what was it like working with glenda Oh, she was lovely. Um, um, again, I'm just saying everyone was lovely. It was really nice. Was anyone bad? No, sorry. <laughs> no. No, I was only joking. No. Um, uh, I mainly remember Glenda, and I know um, on some fan talk on Facebook page, people had said the scene where she developed, she had cancer, and I nursed her. I don't actually remember that very much at all. Very and touching. I think yeah, I think it's because the scenes that you do that you think went well or that were you were comfortable with or that in your head were somehow successful don't stand out in the decades beyond as much as the things that went wrong or the things that were awkward to do. Or yeah, um, it's kind of like when you have in in my teaching when you lecturing and you have really beautiful pleasant um students you don't remember them as much as the ones that caused you trouble <laughs> that is really unfair i know it shouldn't be that way but it kind of is yeah so uh, it's no slight on those scenes and i'm glad people really enjoyed them but i don't remember a lot around it i do remember um, Glenda being on a lot of night shoots because I remember them oh, as yeah. we were leaving to go home they were leaving to go out yeah. and uh, there was a period when she was she was working so hard it was extraordinary and, and we all knew that 
knew what she was sort of going through in terms of her workload. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they're pretty intense. Those scenes she did where she was escaping from the um, the prison to rob the bank. It was yeah, 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 yeah. And of course, you don't. I didn't watch a lot of it as it came on air. Um, so you see, it, you see it all afterwards. You just see her going, coming things, or going, coming back. You know. Yeah. Um, but and the thing is that it shot so far ahead, or then it was shot so far ahead. So it was a. I don't know how much the lead time was. Maybe it was three months. I'm not quite sure. Um, no. Was it three months? Was it? I'm not sure if it was shorter than that or... Ken, do you remember? No, I don't, to be honest. But I would... The, the astounding thing is sort of coming out of that really secluded environment because um, the studio was really isolated at that time there wasn't much out in that area it was you know it wasn't enormous so you when you're out there you couldn't sort of go home you had to stay there yeah. and <laughs> yeah and um so that was your world for such a long time and then suddenly people know who you are it just seems extraordinary it just seems it's a really odd dissonance um and i was going to the milk bar out of this shared house I, I lived in. And the kids from the local high school were sort of sitting on their bikes outside the milk bar. And I was going in to get breakfast. I was looking disheveled and going to get some milk or something for our household. And this guy just screams out, Mullins, you bitch. <laughs> and it was, <laughs> and it, was it was it was kind of, oh, are you talking to me? <laughs> it was really quite strange. What? And they've been watching you, and I've been going there mornings to get milk, you know, for ages. So they must have known who I was. But he'd been hanging out for the perfect time to say that, to say that line. To me. That's funny. Yeah. That we, we spoke to Kate, uh, Kate Hood, not long ago. And uh, oh yes, I met Kate. She was at this yeah. um, seminar we did. Yeah, it was lovely seeing her again. What was that story she said, Ken? She was at a wedding or something and someone, because the storyline was about the child killer and they, they shouted out, you cruel bitch or something, in a, you know, at a, she was at a wedding or something in a garden. And... Yes, and, and the bride. It was the bride. The bride, sorry, yes, the bride. <laughs> it was the bride. bride. <laughs> Broke out of being a bride and suddenly oh. went, you know, yeah. just True went bananas. <laughs> really, really strange. <laughs> the intimacy is really strange, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, I was working in lecturing in media and then I moved over to screen studies, but a big part of the media course in the early 2000s was talk, talking about audience. And that's a big part of the academic area of media was audience analysis. And um, so, yes, I knew that from a... So the intellectual point of view and actually being on the other end of that it's so strange the idea of um having people that that might be a little obsessed by what you do and there are often things you don't remember you did or that were done accidentally or a huge symbolism is given to this yeah yeah and i know i've done it when i've written about films and um, probably things that i gave huge significance to um that weren't intended or throw, throw away things. But I mean, it's kind of, it's kind of like dreaming, isn't it? Yeah. The dream yeah. is how you interpret it. And that's what's really important. Yeah. Um, there are no big universals about that, but it's what you see, what your mind is producing. And I think that's such, such an important thing in fandom is that it's what people get out of it themselves, the pleasure they find in things, whether they're meant to be there or not, you know. Yeah. And so, but that passion is so lovely. I really admire it. Yeah. So do you think you experienced that little bit of fandom at that time? What do you think it's like for the, you know, the celebrities in the US that you know, like well, Al Pacino or Robert De Niro? I mean, they're constantly on the spotlight wherever they go. I mean, it must be hard. I don't think we can imagine it actually. Yeah. I think you can think you might think oh it must be really tough going through that but I it must be 
I can't imagine being so well known and so um, obsessed about, particularly in this current climate where there's so much, so many media platforms for yeah. people to follow you, trace you, analyze you, study you, interpret you. Um, sorry, I'm not just rebooting the little computer down here. And yeah, I think it's probably something to be lived, to be understood. Yeah, definitely. I don't, and certainly they would have ways of coping with it. Um, and they would go into it knowing that that was part of their job. But I'm sure it's really hard for someone who would get shot to fame very quickly. I think yeah. they would find it the hardest. I think uh, Cary Grant summed it up basically when he said, you think it's hard, but I have to be Cary Grant all the time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And Judy Garland said much the same thing. You know, I have to be Judy Garland no matter where I am. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, it's 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 a burden in in some ways, a very he heavy burden, I think, for for people to have to, no matter where they are, still produce what the public expects of them, even when they're out of the public eye. Yeah, a certain extent. Yeah, and particularly if that that ex you know that feedback is negative. You know, that, that would be so hard to deal with trolling and things like, like mm. that. Oh, that's you're just, doing, that's you're just doing your job, yeah. you know, and yeah. you, you don't want to cause any harm or any offence to anyone, but people will just, to use the word projection, will just project onto you what they want. And often that stuff says far more about the people doing it. Yes. <laughs> Ooh. I find that interesting, that whole trolling, the negative, that where people have just got the time to write something. So, I mean, Ken and I have experienced doing this. Even. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. And it's just like, you know, you've sat down to write something like that and it's just, you know, like it doesn't bother us. But, I mean, it's I find it really interesting that they go to the lengths to, you know, write something negative about someone or comment on the way someone looks or what they've done. I mean, it's, it's, it's awful, but, you know. Yeah. It's a strange, yeah. strange world we live in. It is, um, especially now with social media. Yeah. It's got good points and bad points, but, mm. yeah. This is a, um, a universal question that the fans always ask, and, and it is simple. Do you have any funny or stories of, of gossip from the set that you can remember? Um, apart from the things I've already told you, not really. I mean, accidents happening all the time, um, wardrobe mishaps, lighting mishaps, um, line fluffs constantly, having to learn so much material. I'm jiggling around a bit. <laughs> <laughs> um, so much material in, in so little time. Um, People coming out of the offset things that were were funnier. Like I remember going to a swimming pool um, just outside the um, Channel 10 and during one of the big, those big breaks we would have in between shooting scenes, I had enough time to sort of go for a swim. <laughs> There were these girls who were just standing there staring at me in the change room and they didn't go, they just stood there and they just stared. <laughs> it was so, I said, there's something wrong, there's something wrong. And they said, are you on television? <laughs> 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 Things like that is, is the kind of sort of funny, but in terms of gossip, I don't know whether I would tell you any gossip anyway, but I don't remember a lot. Uh, of negative gossip, just fun things. Um, yeah. No, that's okay. Sorry uh, not to be juicy enough. No, no, we don't want juicy. No, just something funny. That, that, that's, no, <laughs> you've told us a lot. It's been great. Um, 
Now, did you have a favourite writer or director on prison? I mean, I know you brought up Kendall's name, which, you know, a lot of people speak about Kendall, which is great. Um, do you have a memory of anyone? Uh, no, they all kind of merged together for me. I enjoyed working with all of them. I don't think there was any, I had any disagreements or problems or no. anything like that, except when Kendall did this mass thing with me, I didn't like that. Um, and the writers, I didn't meet the writers. I think we, they came in and introduced themselves probably a couple of times, but yeah. that was largely a sh um, how do you do kind of experience and that was about it. So it did always seem odd that someone was creating your character and not they were sort of evolving you all. And, and what were they basing those decisions on? Or they were interesting questions that I never spoke. They were very separate. Yeah. yeah. And that's interesting because over in America, a lot of the shows, all the, you know, the production writers and everyone's in the same studio, whereas prisoners, yeah. was, you know, that was separate. So I was very segregated. Yeah. Very. Yeah. Yeah. You, did, you, you didn't get, you didn't have input into that. Well, I didn't, I had a sort of minor role, but no, um, I wasn't, they didn't ask. To discuss anything about it, I just think it was the way things were done. Yeah. On that show, then. Yeah. Mm. The um the news came through during um, the Blackmore episodes that the show was going to be cancelled. Mm -hmm. What was the reaction of the cast uh, to the news? And and well, we know I know what the reaction of the crew crew was, but how did you feel about it personally? It was, I mean, when something is going to be cancelled, you know, when you're told that your job's in going to end, it's always confronting, even though you mightn't have <clears throat> thought you were going to be there forever or you thought you would move on pretty quickly. Yeah. And I was very young then and I wanted to experience more. So, um, yeah, but it's kind of like, oh, I've, I've better get my house in order about what I'm going to do next. Um, if you didn't have options that were coming up, those kind of things, big, bigger discussions with your agent, um, looking more afield at the audition scene, that kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, I don't think it was so much of a shock because there were whispers coming through. And I think that happens in a lot of jobs as well. It's sort of a slow drip. And then there's the sudden announcement of, of it ending. Yeah. Would, would you have stayed on the show longer if it had gone on another year or two? Would you have liked to have seen where the character could have gone? Pro I'm not, look, it's hard to say. Probably not, because I remember at that time I was interested in trying other things and and moving on maybe doing a bit yeah. more theatre, uh, experiencing a bit more and being very aware of getting stuck in one groove too early. Um yeah, if I, you know, I think it's a would be a very different question if you were a long term cast member yeah. and you were much older, and the role was a very very established established role role in the fandom, you know, as well as in the culture of the series. Yeah. So, yeah. As it as it turned out, you and I both went on to do Neighbours. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yes, yeah, I and I don't remember much about that role, yeah. I don't remember much either. <laughs> well, I do remember Scott and Charlene's wedding. Yes. That was that yeah. period. Now, a few of the actors and crew you worked with on Prisoner are sadly no longer with us. Can you share any memories of working with people like Gerda Nicholson, Joy Westmore, Taya Stratton, Justine Saunders, Mari Trevor, Ian Coglin? Kendall himself? Um, uh, yeah, I had a few scenes with Joy Westmore um, and just a few brief scenes with Gerda Nicholson right at the beginning, I think. Yeah. Um, again, my memories were very pleasant. They were lovely to work with, very professional people. Taya, I'd been at VCA with, so she was in my year at VCA. Um, yeah. And, but oddly enough, 
she was, we never really worked together because we were never in a performance. We were never in the same play. I don't think ever in the whole of the three years that we were there. So I'd worked with Philip and Kylie. We did the Cherry Orchard when we were in first year. I'd worked with Victoria Rowland in a play called For the Love of a Good Man, which was our final year at college. But, and there were always, um, so the other half of the year would be in another production. And Taya was always in another production. So I never got to work with her too much. And I think on Prisoner, I had a few little things, but I never had any big scenes with, and she was on before I was yeah. in there. Um, but yeah, it was just a, a very, very um, sad for us when we learned that she passed away. Mm. Was definitely gone way too young. Yeah. Um, now, I mean no offence with this next question because I'm only going on what are on all the, the prisoner groups and I think there was even a book that mentioned at the time how factual it was. I'm not sure, but <laughs> there was... Spec you should be asking this question, Ken. No. <laughs> Don't be afraid. Go on, ask me anything. No, there was speculation at the time that you were you were pregnant on the show. Um, <laughs> I read later that. stages. Was, was that true or can we put a... End of the rumours here. <laughs> you can put an end to the I wasn't pregnant. I just put on weight. It's simple as that, you know, people do. Yep. Uh, and it was toward the end of the show and I was in that terrible prison garb, <laughs> which is so unflattering anyway. And you look heavier on television. Um, I don't know about now, but then on the, our tiny little screens you did. Yeah. Um, so, it, it, yeah, so I had put on weight and it would have given the impression of being bigger with the costume and the, the technology at the time as well, I guess. So that was, that was all that was. Yeah. I, and I, and, and I, find it I find it fascinating that, you know, a book, I can't even remember what it was called, but could just write something. You know, and obviously, I haven't even checked with yourself. So no, no one's asked me about it except you. Yeah. I'm naughty, naughty. But <laughs> the thing about uh, perhaps why I didn't even bother was that um, I was very comfortable. And on that program, I and I suspect a lot of people loved it because it showed women in all different shapes and sizes. Yeah, and it was accepting of that. Now, at the time in the 80s, that wasn't the case. People, people would look at your body very, very closely yeah. um, as part of the casting process. And you got a bit of that on the newsreader. And it was a very sexist environment, very. Stories I could tell you, <laughs> but I won't. Um, and so it was kind of an opportunity to not worry about that for a little while. Yeah, imprisonment was, and it, it also. Uh, I remember that that whole uh, being sort of out there and stuck out there, and not being able to go back and forward, and sort of living in, um, at the studios a bit. <laughs> I remember the food wasn't great. <laughs> food was terrible. <laughs> the canteen. Um, yes, but that that dispels that that myth. Yeah, and it's even on a YouTube, there's a clip of, you know, Prisoner and you in it, and, and the comments, you know, there was people arguing about, oh, no, she was because she was holding <laughs> so many sheets in the laundry. They always had the basket in front of her, and, you know, it was just, it's insane. But, okay, so know, we've, heard, was, we've heard of him, was, she were not pregnant, sorry. Prisoner, so there we go. Let's sue the book. No. <laughs> I, I don't really care, but I, I would... You know, I would caution people about about assuming that just because someone has put on weight, yeah, you know, or someone doesn't appear as they did before. You know, actors aren't static people in their appearance, like everybody else, um, but most are because they're in certain roles and they're signed on to be this particular character, and so you you only see them in that phase. I mean, I guarantee if you saw a lot of actors out of the phase of them working in those particular roles, you would see them in different body shapes. Yeah. And I think it's really important to 
um, say that that's okay. I mean, just because a woman is a bit larger or is put on weight, she's not automatically pregnant. <laughs> Maybe they should look at pregnant women more carefully and see where the bumps actually do occur. <laughs> but, but the idea of hiding behind laundry baskets, I find that fascinating. It, it was totally, no, if I did, it was accidental. I remember seeing Stephen Soderbergh talk about his film Solaris. Have you seen Solaris? Oh, I haven't. His film? There's one scene where the female character, who is the wife of a psychiatrist, and he's thinking back to his past with her, she's actually died, um, and it's set in the future, is on a train, and she's just sitting there with a doorknob, a, a kind of brass, large brass doorknob, and I'm sure, you know, people looking at the film, writing about the film, that could be so symbolic for a number of reasons, couldn't it? But apparently, I could be wrong, but this is from my memory of an interview he gave, I think, or something I read. He said he just asked her to go to the props box and pick up something. <laughs> oh. You know, that's, that's how it goes. I know, it's funny that. <laughs> <laughs> read into things on movies and go, wow, that that's that's for there for a reason. Deep and yeah, and Deep then you find out it wasn't. <laughs> but then again, if you find meaning in it, that's important for you, isn't it? Yeah. That's yeah. I know, but this um, discussion was insane about you know, oh, she that that's why she folded so many sheets in the laundry. They had it <laughs> down. And I'm like, she wasn't falling down. She, she was still walking around. Like, <laughs> I'd say the laundry scenes were my least favourite scenes because they always seem really boring to me. Like the dialogue was, I, I never had any action in the laundry. Like no one got burnt or threatened, yeah. I don't think. Um, but it was always explaining something or talking about something that had happened. So to me, they, they were kind of the least interesting scenes I had to do. Oh. So I probably folded to sh the sheets to <laughs> sort of pass the time. I don't know. You're still good at folding sheets or terrible. <laughs> I begin to wonder whether the props guys were asked to bring in bigger and bigger laundry baskets, you know. <laughs> um my one of my favorite programs uh, I did mention that I love is The Bold and the Beautiful. I oh. love that show. It kind of petered out when the characters who were my age sort of went off and the younger characters came in. But now the new Taylor is back and I'm really into it. But I remember when the actress who played the old Taylor, Hunter Tylo, was pregnant on the set and <laughs> she would just walk in front of a vase. It was really, and they had made all these accommodations, which I think is great um, for her pregnancy. And I think the woman who was playing Brooke was also pregnant in some stage and they would walk in front of a huge bunch of flowers and it was so obvious but it was like an agreed contract I think between the audience and um the makers of the show I thought my dad was the only fan of Bold and the Beautiful he's in his 60s and, and loves that show <laughs> it's really good I like the Brooke and Taylor synergy I think that's my <laughs> my favorite you're Bold and the Beautiful fan Ken or no but I know Darren Hinch is Okay. Oh, is he? <laughs> Apparently so. It's a great show. It was I got hooked on it because in the when it just after it first started, and um, we had to do it as part of our course. Oh. I think it was in in masters, or it might have been something I did earlier. But we had to study a soap opera for a week, and there were certain things in about our viewing that we had to analyse. So I chose that one to watch for a week and I just got hooked on it. Wow. So I see you've been watching it ever since. Yes. Wow. Yeah. But when they start to repeat storylines, I get a bit bored because I think, oh, I've seen that before. They <laughs> did that before. It's usually to do with a child or a marriage or Ridge leaving Brooke for Taylor and then going back to... I Brooke. know Ridge. Is he still in it? There's another ridge now. There's a oh, ridge. another ridge. Okay. Yeah. He's always got a lot going on, Ridge, from what I've seen. There's, there's always a lot of things happening for Ridge. You're admitting you've seen some of it. I've seen parts. What is all of it? 
I think you should tune in. I want to do a whole other podcast on Bold and Beautiful. You know? <laughs> you, you, I, bet if, I bet if you did, you'd get a huge fan reaction to that. <laughs> That's worth thinking about. Yeah. I yeah. think it is worth thinking about. Did you receive a lot of attention from fans and viewers when you were out and about at the time of the show? Um, and, and all right, apart from you bitch Mullins, uh, <laughs> where is the most unusual place you've been recognised? Oh, gosh. Um, in a restaurant where the waiter would come up and they, uh, people tend to do this thing where they just stop and they just stare. <laughs> <laughs> and you kind of doesn't register for a minute. You think if I got some lettuce on my lip or something. <laughs> Um, yeah, then they, they ask you, are you? Oh, and they sort of say, oh, you look so different. <laughs> Television, so different. Yeah, so it's been, I think, in restaurants. Um, yeah, high school kids around the corner. And the fandom, yes, there was at the time, people certainly wanted autographs and autograph cards. That was a huge thing. Yeah. And... Uh, then later on, when it was played in the UK, there was a lot of mail, I remember, from the UK coming over. And then at university, I, they would send it through because uh, I guess that's the way they would contact me online. They would see that I worked there and then put it through that channel. I just got something uh, a couple of weeks ago, which was really unexpected. Oh, really? <laughs> it was local people. Yeah. Wow. Um, wanting to sign some pictures. I mean, it's really, it's been quite, apart from Mullins, you bitch, it's been really quite <laughs> sweet and generous and um, yeah. warm yeah. to hear from people who are interested. Because people, why are people interested in, hey, why are people interested in this? You don't get, because uh, it's not an audience in front of you. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's very odd. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. Um, are you still in contact with anyone from the show that you've remained friends with? Uh, no, uh, I'm in contact well, with Kylie Valley. We've yeah. got a group of friends from the same year at VCA yeah. and we get together and you know, chat and catch up and sometimes um, we see Kylie there. So that's, and the others not, no, no, I haven't been in touch with any of them. How, how great is Kylie? She, she was amazing. <laughs> She's yeah. good, isn't she? Yeah, she was great. Yeah. Yes. Are you surprised? about how popular the show still is after all these decades. Yes, I am. Yes. It'd be really interesting to hear what young people um, like about it, you know, what they find gripping about it, or gripping, you know, what their interest is, whether it's nostalgia, something to yeah. do with that, um, and also the interest overseas. By an Australian women's prison. I, I watched Wentworth and I didn't watch it really until a couple of years ago and I really enjoyed it. It was great. And Pamela Ray as oh, the freak like is yeah. just, um, uh, she's hysterical, isn't she? <laughs> I remember there was one scene I watched where a prisoner came in that she didn't quite like and as soon as she left, she's very subtly picked up this deodorising spray and sprayed, <laughs> sprayed her around the table. I know in the pencils on Lovely. the table, you know, she rearranges. Yeah. Yeah. It's great. Um, uh, so going back to your question, Ken, what, so I've lost my train of thought. Well, just about, about the, the surprise about, about how popular the show is. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I am surprised. Yeah. I am surprised. Um, but in a way, I guess I shouldn't be surprised because it was a real slice of our history, yeah. our cultural history. And for women, it was very important. For actresses, it was very important at that time um, that uh, you could get an acting gig on television because you were an, a good actor. Yeah. Um, and that's really important. 
and that people saw that and they could perhaps see characters that were more like themselves on tele. I mean, you get that now. There's such a, a range of things yeah. we can see. But if you'd never see yourself represented, yeah. that's tough, you know, in popular media. And here there were a whole group and range of women on there that other women could look at and, and you perhaps in some way sort of identify with. Um, maybe not directly, maybe in an oblique kind of way. But yeah, that's or true. looking at a, a stereotype, this one cookie cutter all the time. And that was fascinating and interesting. And women could be angry and they yes. could be violent and they could be violent with each other. Um, and they weren't, you know, either a mother figure or a um, love interest figure, which is in those days was very much the kind of binary you were getting cut into. Yeah, definitely. Um, um, oh, yes. Sorry, I know, I know we, uh, we just spoke about Wentworth, but I just want to touch on something about Wentworth. So what's interesting about Wentworth is now that that had a very big younger generation of, of fans, and then yeah. fans have worked out, oh, that was based on a TV show back from the, the 70s and 80s called Prisoner. So Prisoner's now attracted a whole new younger generation right. of fans which is it's been amazing and and so, isn't it fascinating to see the characters like the character of lizzie be reborn into another character yeah. and have her story kind of stretched out Definitely. and then the freak and um um Vin vinegar tips that's oh, Vera. yeah kate atkinson yeah 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 and have that that title kind of unpacked for you in a storyline of why she's called that. Um, I think that's really interesting yeah, and great. And especially during the pandemic, people got out, they were saying people got very hungry for nostalgia, you know, things from yeah. the 80s, 70s, 90s. So yeah. It's good. And it wasn't an easier world then, I have to say. It's a tough world now, but it wasn't necessarily easier then. It's yeah. just different. Um, Sorry, Ken. Can you tell us what your technique for learning your lines is? Ken, it's very basic. <laughs> just, <laughs> was just, um, uh, to, to just memorise them. I, would, um, I don't really remember the technique I used to do it. I think, God, I couldn't do it now. Um, but you'd have like this wad of writing to take home with you in the taxi and, and learn at night before you had to get up at five o'clock and go back in. And in those in-between breaks, you would try and learn your lines. But you also had other cast members. And I, from my memory, sometimes even people who were extras who be, you became friendly with, who would help out with the lines. So you would practice them with other cast members during those rest periods yeah and that was really helpful or you would practice it with the people who you were actually doing the scene with which was even better uh, in those those interim periods and and that's the way you would memorize it more but a lot of people you know there was a lot of fluffing of lines when you were shooting and, and that was frustrating uh, but the amount of stuff you had to get through in, in such a quick amount of time because they were churning it out yeah it's a lot <laughs> who, who yeah. fluffed their lines the most do you think i'm not saying <laughs> i do know but i'm not saying <laughs> good job the spot there it's all good <laughs> um now this time i get to say a lot okay your first episode, episode 657, first broadcast on the 28th of August, 1986. It was written by Ian Coghlan and Andrew Kennedy, directed by Kendall Flanagan. The studio cameramen were Wayne Lavender, Jeff Biggs, Mark Allen and myself. This is where Lisa dyes her hair. Lisa tries to get a message to Lester through... Uh, 
through Spider, Wendy urges her to be careful and suggests that Kath is working for the police and was taken out to be briefed. Spider takes Lisa's message for Lester, but reads it herself first. What was it like <laughs> filming your first episode, meeting and, and working with everyone? And what was a typical day on set like? I remember not knowing, like not having um, known the full history of all of this. And so pretending to be you know, so um, understanding and involved in the storyline that I knew nothing about <laughs> coming straight into it. <laughs> you know what I mean? So Lester, like... Good old Lester. That? Okay, that was my boyfriend. All right. Okay, Lester. Um, <laughs> the one intense. I was anchoring after contacting. Um, <laughs> with no real idea of who he was or uh, the history of Spider or anything like that. It was really yeah, yeah, kind of getting through it yeah. and um, trying to, to come across as though, yes, oh, yeah, I knew this. This is all part of my, <laughs> my history and my character. Um, and it was, it, was, it was a whirlwind. It was daunting trying to get through it because there were so many lines to learn and then learning how to act for television. We trained in doing that at VCA, but it's, you know, briefly, mainly we are just trained to do theatre stuff. Yeah. We had a very, very, only maybe six weeks in camera training. Oh, which wow. was given, given that the majority of people ended up doing television. It was very brief. Um, so it was getting a handle of that technique and hitting your mark and things like that. Um, and learning which cameras were on you and, and how to play the camera and how to tone it down from, you know, having projected a lot of stuff in theatre before. So it, that was hard. So it was getting, getting my head around a lot of things yeah. at the same time um, and still not having a real idea that a lot of people, I think I said this before, that so many people were going to see it. Yeah. Um, like they're going to see this, I guess. <laughs> um, yeah. Yes. And being, being trying, and I was much younger, so much less exhausted, I guess, of going through the lines and yeah. the hours and the big, the, the long work days. Yeah. And what a boyfriend you had, Lester. I mean, Pentridge, and he, he sounded like a real bad guy, Lester. <laughs> yeah, see, this is it. I still have no image of Lester, who Lester was. <laughs> did I ever meet him? I don't think so, no. <laughs> <laughs> he just, he's just in the background. <laughs> is he? Oh, oh. <laughs> in, in television, like in Fraser. Do you wish to see come Fraser? Oh, Fraser. I love Fraser. Yeah. That's another one of my favourites. Yes. The character oh, of Meris. No. You never see Meris. But you've got such a strong idea of who she is. I know. I think that technique is brilliant. But no, I don't have a strong idea of who Lester is. Except I think he was bad to the bone. <laughs> but going back to Meris just for a minute, I mean, it's so frustrating because you've got such a... She's in nearly every episode they talk about her. <laughs> and you have such a vision of her and you just want to like, what, who is she? What does she look like? <laughs> You know, I picture some lady sort of small with black rim glasses and <laughs> hairstyle, but um, that show is coming back too, which I'm really looking forward to. They're, is it really? Yeah, they're, he's, um, they're trying to work out... Revive? Revival, yeah. So they're trying to work out a storyline where he maybe comes back as a uh, art director or so he's not on radio anymore. And yeah. yeah, I hope it does well because Murphy Brown came back and that didn't do... Oh, that's right, yeah. Didn't do as, as well. Um, yeah, I think Fraser was an amazing I love show. That. It was so funny. I still watch it now. Uh, one of them was... Because uh, I told you my interest was in Jung. One of them is a Jungian analyst and the other one is a Freudian trained yeah. analyst. Yeah. And the brother is the Jungian one. And he has to... I love the episode where he takes over his role because Fraser's sick, and he says, <laughs> he says Un unlike unlike um, Fraser, I'm a Jungian, not a Freudian, so there'll be no blaming mother today. <laughs> <laughs> yes, my wife uh, loves Fraser's brother. No. Oh, Niles. Yeah. Isn't no. he wonderful? Isn't yeah. he wonderful? 
is so funny. I love that. And they make it work like brothers. You can so believe those guys are brothers, can't you? Yeah. And how good's a dad on the on, on his little chair on his little chair? Oh, it does yeah. nothing matches the, the apartment whatsoever. <laughs> but he's still got <laughs> yeah, great show. Sorry, I've gone off topic. Um okay, we'll get to the fan questions, but episode 692, which was your last, you know, was your last episode, the last episode of Prisoner. Yeah. I know we touched on it a little bit, but do you have a memory to share just about what it was like on the very last day? Like, were the cast emotional or the crew, or they just knew they had to make it right, the last scenes? Look, again, I don't know whether I was in a lot of the last scenes. Um, I, I, I remember that day. I remember shooting it. Uh, and they were dragging the freak out, weren't they? She was going... Yeah, um, getting her comeuppance. We were all wondering how that was going to pan out. I remember because we didn't have the scripts before. Oh, okay. uh, uh, I just remember the after party. <laughs> Maybe which was a lot of fun. Yeah. Yes. Wow. Um, okay, fan question. So, shall I go on Stuart's first? Or? Why not? Okay. I think so. Stuart Kerry said, I think Terry's Lisa developed with a much with much softer edges than Nikki's Lisa, which comes over as a personal portrayal more than a script. I wonder if Terry is still in contact with any of her old castmates, which we have covered, but I just wanted to read that comment for you from uh, All right. Well, that's interesting. I think they were they were two very different yes. takes on the character. You know, I think Nikki's Lisa was totally different Definitely. and that was how she interpreted it and, and, you know, her stamp on it. Yeah. Mm. I'll just go back to Jason Burridge's question because he, he did ask a lot of questions but and most of them have been covered. But um, one question uh, he did ask was, did you know that the show was being cancelled when you took the part? No, no, we didn't know then. Uh, I think I was only in it for three and a half or four months. So when I took the part, um, there were questions around it. I think people, uh, but not right at the beginning, or it could have been that I wasn't so politically aware of the machinations of the show at the beginning. I was just trying to get a handle on being there and doing the character. Yeah. Uh, it, there could have been other other people who had been there longer, more established. You know, um, my computer keeps shutting down. <laughs> um, they they could have known, but no, I didn't know until later. Yeah. But you're always yeah. trying to to plan what your next move would be anyway, and that was the actor's life, which I didn't quite like very much. Yeah, the unknown. <laughs> yeah, that insecurity. I mean, when you're young, it's exciting. It's yeah. very exciting. But as you get older and you start accumulating things in your life, <laughs> you need a bit more stability. Definitely. His final comment was, um, I thought she was a feisty, memorable character and a great addition to the final cast. I found the scenes with her spying on Rodney Adams to be particularly funny, very <laughs> camp, especially in those big 80s sunglasses. Wasn't that crazy and that wig? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, it was so much fun because that was finally a chance to get outside a bit more. Yeah. Um, no, that was just fun. Yeah, and it was camp. It was really <laughs> camp. I must go back and watch that again. Yeah, and my family fun. has seen much more of this than I have <laughs> in replay. I don't like looking at myself on the screen um, and things I've done very much. I don't know whether many people are comfortable with that. Um, but I remember doing it, yeah, and wearing those short skirts and those big glasses and the big shoulder pads of those blazers in the 80s that they had. Was that your fashion when in your personal life? Or? No. <laughs> I think I wore leggings and, I don't know, off-the-shoulder T-shirts, whatever. It was big then in bright blue, you know, that yeah. neon blue that was big in the 80s. Um, Ken, next one. Yes, Terry, uh, Mickey C 
says, Terry was brilliant in the role. She had some truly amazing and unforgettable scenes with Roseanne Hull Brown, Paula Duncan and Glenda Linscott, a definite highlight of the show's final year. Oh, that's lovely. That's really lovely to hear that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, oh, Peter Messia said, hi, Terry. I really loved your portrayal of Lisa in Prisoner. What was it like filming that scene with Philip Hyde when you were taking photos of him practicing his amateur play acting? I can't remember what episode it was, but I thought it was hilarious. And what was it like? Did we go to a hall? Yeah. Wasn't he doing it in a big hall somewhere? <laughs> it was funny. <laughs> well, Philip and I were quite sort of um, friends then. So I think we enjoyed doing it. Um, and that, you know, from acting school, we'd just come out of it in the same year. Um, and he'd been in a lot of the productions that I'd been in, we were in the same things a lot of the time. Yeah, so we knew each other quite well. Um, and we probably just had a lot of fun and it was, yeah, fun to do. Yeah. Silly and fun. It was, it was funny. <laughs> um, I, Bonnie Davis Shacko, says, and this is a question and, and a comment. Oh, wow, she looks amazing. I would love to ask her if she'd have stayed longer, what she'd have wanted for her character. I wanted to compliment her on how touching her scene with Rita was when she knew she was sick. Makes me always tear up. Oh, isn't that beautiful? Oh, that's such a lovely thing to say. Thank you. It's really lovely. Um, it is hard to get into those sort of more emotional scenes. And the prisoner did have those lovely kind of turns that were very human and non-camp. And then it would go into being high camp and it would, would go back to being um, quite intimate. Um, and you would enjoy doing things like that. And it's probably, as I said before, that enjoyable stuff that you don't quite remember because it was comfortable. And, but I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm glad that people found that moving. Yeah, yeah. A, lot of, a lot of fans did. Um, Darren Hembro, oh my, how great is this interview going to be? Love <laughs> both leases, but I'd love to know what, if any, were the plans for Lisa should the show have gone on and when the axe came down on the show? Um, P.S., you're a fantastic addition to the show. You. I have no idea, but <laughs> they might have wanted to get rid of me. I don't know. Um, you and Lester could have got happily married after and had kids. I probably think that story could have opened up more um, <laughs> with her and Lester. Yeah. Um, I, who knows? She could yeah. have be become a warden. Um, <laughs> Another hair colour change. Yeah. It would have been nice for her to, because she was soliciting but uh, she was also a con woman so it might have been nice to play up her con woman skills a bit more that would have been to make her a bit more sly and, and and treacherous in in fooling people now that the art of the con is you know it's great isn't it on um on streaming channels oh netflix yeah netflix so many series about this i oh, know it's amazing <laughs> yeah so those things could have been possibilities yeah. I don't know. There, there could be an, a, new, a Lisa in Wentworth. They could make a con woman in a similar role. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Jay Shaw says, excellent actress, enjoyed her rapport and relationships with the other characters. Her friendship with Merle especially was great. Who did you enjoy working with and have you seen or stayed in contact with any of the other cast? Um, well, I think I said before it was Philip I, that I remember, and it was Paula Duncan, uh, who I was a little bit starstruck about because I'd seen her in Cop Shop before. Yes. She was lovely. Yes, and um, Roseanne, they were the main people I did work with. And no, I don't, I haven't kept in contact with them um, for so decades. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Mark Harry said, hi, Terry, love you as Lisa, and I have a random question. I've always assumed that the sleight of hand magic that Nikki did 
was written in for her and that was something you asked him to write out when you took over? No, I didn't. I didn't even know she did that. I can't remember, but that would have been great. Yeah. Imagine all the tricks she could have done with the prison cell walls. <laughs> she could have unpicked locks. She could have... <laughs> she could have been quite a trickster. That would have been fabulous. Yeah. I wish they'd kept that up. <laughs> I think they missed out there, yeah. I've got one from Kevin McConaughey. Um, what were Terry's memories of being told the series was ending? Did Terry ever audition for other parts on Prisoner? No, I didn't audition for other parts on Prisoner. I got straight into that one. Yep. Um, yeah. And I, I think we talked about the idea it was ending. Of course, it was pretty yeah. sad. Um, um, yeah. Yeah. No, I didn't. And I didn't um, think of auditioning for it before because there were no parts to audition for. There were lots of parts after that. <laughs> Hundreds of things I auditioned for after that. Yeah. Um, Pat, now, I'm, I haven't read this book myself, so I'm not sure, but Patty Barrett said, Terry, Nikki Paul was very open in Behind the Bars book about not enjoying her brief time on Prisoner due to various cast hierarchies and other issues. Did you experience any teething problems before you settled into the role in Cast Ensemble, which you've said you had an enjoyable time, but yeah, I just read that question out. Yeah, uh, she did. Um, yes, I feel for her if, if that was her experience, Yeah, because that could be really tough, um, really tough when you feel that way. Uh, but I didn't have that experience. And again, it, it, it was a very different circumstance. It was much more about um, just coming in, coping, doing it, surviving the first part because it was all so quick and uh, moving on. Whereas I imagine, I just imagine with Nikki, there would have been an audition process. She would have carved the character. She would have created it she had done background research on it so it was more of a um, um i don't know a multiple step process for her to get there so the depth of her understanding of that character was much would have been much greater than mine and she would have known exactly what she was getting into you know all those kinds of things yeah. that that made it a very different experience yeah just, just quickly before Ken asks the question, um, do you enjoy audition processes at the time? Oh, no, I hate it. Oh, you hated them? Okay. <laughs> I like Horrible. Them. Horrible. I mean, I think there was one, no, there was one I had fun with, which was actually the funnest thing I did called The Dame is Loaded, Yeah. which was one of the first interactive videos. And I played this character called Frankie, who was a journalist, and it was sort of gumshoe detective set in America. Chicago or New York or something. And the audition process was just fun. <laughs> it was just fun. We had a female director on it. And I laughed. I remember just laughing a lot. And had that, uh, I told you before, that lovely uh, makeup uh, woman who put cucumbers on your eyes and would treat you like a big movie star. She was just lovely. Um, that uh, was yet to hit. Wow. Well, uh, just just going back to um, Nikki, Paul, and yourself, this next comment from Martin Duggan covers both of you. I, he says, I love the character of Lisa Mullins. So that's a compliment for both of you. Very nice. And Joseph ID also said she looks really well. And, and I have to say that's also a very, there's a lot of comments saying the same thing, how beautiful you look. How young oh. you look, how amazing you look. I mean, I couldn't, <laughs> I can go and get them if you want to hear more, but there was another. No one tells you that in academia. Let me just say that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That's lovely. It's very flattering. Thank you. Uh, this one from Len Fries. You took over that role so well. I actually preferred your Lisa to that of Nikki Paul. Sorry, Nikki, in brackets. I will always remember the scene where the freak grabs you and throws you in a cell, shutting the door behind her. 
you've been you've been getting too big for your boots, Mullins. It's about time someone brought you back into line. That moment was so iconic as it was the first time we'd seen the freak put those gloves on to yes. bash a prisoner for a very long time. I know. Yes. Well, the other girls had to tell me what that meant. <laughs> when Maggie put the, the gloves on and she did that scene and they said, you know what the gloves mean, don't you? And I said, oh, <laughs> no. <laughs> I think it was a bit more than bashing, actually, but um, the implication. Yes. <laughs> I had no idea. I knew she was being very heavy with me, but that was about it. Yeah. Because there was a period where the, Maggie wasn't bashing anyone up, Ken. It was, <laughs> you know, she had Shane, she had the adopted son, she was being all nice. And, and then all of a sudden, the, the, yeah, the gloves come on and off she goes. <laughs> Scenes with Maggie. I mean, we've had Maggie on, uh, who was great. What was it like with, working with Maggie? Oh, she was terrific, yeah. Yeah, yeah she was fun. Um and again, I guess that was a sort of starstruck thing because you certainly knew who she was yeah. and you knew the character of the freak. And I do love the way that character has been taken, you know, in, in a different way in Wentworth. I just, I think that evolution is wonderful between, between those older and the newer characters. But no, she was, she was good and she was, she was generous. And yeah. I don't think I had a lot of scenes with her from my memory, not a lot. I, uh, I remember the bashing scene. I remember the gloves. What does that mean? So, so naive. Just, just on Wentworth for a minute. I just want. I'd like to ask you. What, what did you think of the storyline of, you know, her going into jail and becoming, you know, basically a crazy person? Yeah, she's gone from. Yeah, the yeah. And I love the bit where she she was actually still alive. Oh, yes, yes. That was quite good. Interesting, but I think I preferred it when she was the... Governor. Was she the governor? Yeah, she took over being the governor, didn't she? I think I preferred that because she had... She could do those really smart-ass things and had those lovely little touches because yeah. Pamela Reid is such a wonderful actor and was she was able to inject that humour and that cynicism just so beautifully. Oh. That's what I loved about her when she was in that governor role. I think there was less opportunity to do that when she became entrenched in the, in the prison culture. Prison, yeah. yeah, I mean, this is a simple scene, but I mean, I always found it fascinating was, was the pencils, how she had all the pencils lined up on her desk. <laughs> straight, you know, she's just done something really bad, but then she'd straighten her, her pencil. Obsessive, compulsive <laughs> behaviour. <laughs> And then the spraying, I don't have to spray. Get a spray. Yeah. Um, last comment before we let you go. So Ben Tempest said, one of my favourite characters of the series, she was all class. <laughs> really? Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> mm, I don't quite know what to say to, to that. Um, okay. Yes. She was fun. Yes. <laughs> um, that has been amazing. I would love to thank you from the bottom of my heart as a fan and on behalf of all the other fans out in the prisoner world uh, for coming on and talking with us and oh, about your thank life. Thank you so much. I'm on Prisoner. Um, Ken, anything you'd like to add? Very kind of you to come on, Terry, and, and thank you very much. And I like the way Matt just does that newsreader thing with his script at the end okay. where he just taps it together and <laughs> signaling closing you know. time like when they turn the lights out and <laughs> start to put the chairs on the tables <laughs> thank you so much i'm always fascinated that people are interested um it's a surreal experience but it's lovely and it's really warming and thank you so much for this forum and you've got some great people yeah. On and I'm sure lots of other people will be <clears throat> up and about in the future. Well, Spend you have a love. big fan base out there, and you're very much loved by all the fans. And um, oh, that's I'm sure really that's lovely. <laughs> Thank you so much. Lovely. 
That was episode 38 of Talking Prisoner. Thank you for watching. Please like and subscribe to our YouTube channel, Talking Prisoner, and share this interview everywhere you can. And please also like our Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter pages. And this episode will also be available across all the podcast platforms, including Apple, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Google, Amazon, and all the other hundreds of them. And also on the talkingprisoner.com website. Thank you so much, Terry. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you.